Hi, everybody. Um, you're very welcome to this session, uh, Surviving Danger Zone uh, Docs. My name is Siobhan Sinnerton. I'm Commissioning Editor for News and Current Affairs at Channel 4, um, and also I have made lots of documentaries over the years in hostile environments myself. Um, I'm also here uh, as a representative of the Rory Peck Trust, which um, if you make films in hostile environments and you're freelance, I hope you know by anyway, mm -hmm. um, a, a charity that um, provides practical information for people that um, are going to go off into these areas. We're going to um, have, a, have a chat and show some clips for about an hour, and then I'm going to throw it open uh, to Q&A. And uh, I really do want people to ask as many questions as possible and for it to be really interactive. So I'm going to leave quite a bit of time for that. Um, but first of all, let me uh, introduce the panel, who I hope are going to give you lots of really good practical tips for how to stay out of trouble whenever you go off to dangerous places. Um, and undoubtedly, some really interesting, exciting, and um, terrifying tales as we go along as well. Stacey Dooley um, has made many, many, many investigative films for the BBC, uh, from the mean streets of Magaluf to the meth labs <laughs> the of hardest, Mexico. That one. Yeah, proper hostile environment, <laughs> yeah. that. Um, and everything in, in between. Um, Becky Prosser uh, has made many films about uh, the crim criminal underworlds from sex trafficking, drugs trafficking, and the arms trade. Um, and to all our horror came to public attention last year when she was uh, arrested and imprisoned in Indonesia uh, for five months. And she's going to talk a bit about that, amongst other things. Uh, because I think there's an awful lot of insight to be gained from that. Shay Rhodes, on the end, is, uh, has done about 20 Unreported Worlds, Channel 4's uh, foreign affairs series, and has had to negotiate his way out of many, many sticky situations. Um, and hopefully he's going to tell us the best ways of doing that. So, Shay, I think we're going we're gonna to start with... Um, I've asked each of the panelists have chosen two clips each from their enormous body of work um, that they want to talk about that will kick us off on, sp on specific issues. Um, so, Shay, I'm going to start with you. Mm -hmm. um, and you've, you've been in dangerous situations, in many different types of dangerous situations, mm. but the first clip that you want to talk about is a full-on all-out war, basically, yes. that you suddenly find yourselves in. Self in. Mm. Um, tell us a little bit about <coughs> the background to the clip. Um, so uh, I was in Ivory Coast uh, during what's, what's now become, become known as the Battle for Abidjan. Um, we went out to cover a country which we thought was on the brink of civil war. It had been for a number of years, actually, leading up to, up to that point, but it was becoming apparent that sometime in the next 12 months this country was going to descend into civil war. P politics had kind of fallen apart and the United Nations were taking up strategic positions, preparing for, for a battle. Um, we thought we were going out to make a film about how ordinary people are affected by, by political sort of, uh, well, for the lack of a, polit of a political sort of structure at all. You know, the government wasn't functioning, none of the public services were functioning. So we wanted to find out how people were, were dealing with that and what their hopes were for the future. Um, and whether or not they thought that war was inevitable, as the rest of the wor world was starting to think. Um, and But while we were there, the situation kind of deteriorated quickly. Within, within sort of a, a week, 10 days of our arriving, it became apparent that, that the civil war had actually started um, and that it was so quiet in the way that it started that very few people would, had really realized. And within a few days, it became a, a proper war situation. You couldn't drive down the road. There were gunshots and armies were setting up in, in different locations around our hotel and suddenly we were in no man's land. So the video you're about to, to see, or the clip you're about to see, is um, of what happened basically once we realized we could no longer leave the hotel, we were stuck in our hotel for about 10 days, and what we were seeing and how we were dealing with that. Okay, we'll have the clip, thanks. <laughs> mm. <laughs> So that, so that, that was, was that um, was um, that was that was I mean obviously completely terrifying to look at for starters, but also very very quick thinking on your behalf mm. that 
you were in really serious trouble in that situation because effectively they just declared war on all foreigners. And it's worth saying that your your camera PD who was shooting that mm. is, was white. Yeah. Um, and you, you, how, how did you so quickly realise, I know exactly what I have to do here? It's really smart, thank um, you. To be honest, Siobhan, there weren't a huge amount of options. <laughs> 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 it, was, uh, it was the guys with the chains and the guns uh, and me and Alex. And really, the only way out was to try and stick as close as possible to the guys with the guns, which <laughs> sounds odd. But there was guys with chains and sticks who were really uncontrollable, and there were guys with guns who were on the whole military and were there to protect somebody important. So by inserting ourselves into their company, we became the important people for the, the 10, 15 minutes it took for us to get out of there. And that, I mean, that's quite often the situation, isn't it, is that you have to befriend yep. the bad guys with guns, effectively, yeah. Um, in order to you know, ensure your own safety. Yeah, it's essential. Um, often you're making a film about them or you're making a film about the things that they do, but it's really important to remember that in many situations they are your only security, they're the only option. Um, so you need to maintain yeah, a good relationship with as many of them as possible. So I know you chose that clip because um, it's an example of you going off to make one film and then the situation suddenly changing very quickly and you find you find that you're in a, a very sticky situation do you want to just talk a little bit about what happened yeah. uh, what happened after that so I mean that was that was the moment when we realized that this country is actually not not on the verge but is actually an, in war um, we kind of came out of that situation, managed to get out of it alive, but we got back to the, to the hotel and couldn't get into our hotel because it was surrounded by uh, this guy's supporters who were, who were generally there to harass foreigners. Um, and I believe it was two days later we woke up in the morning and the hotel staff said, look, we can't let you out. They locked the gates. Nobody was allowed out of the hotel. And that went on for just over 10 days, nearly, nearly two weeks until the... French army came in and rescued us. We were essentially refugees um, from then on. They took us back to the French army base, which had turned into a massive refugee camp. Um, and we stayed there for a couple of days before deciding to, to leave and go and try and film more of what was going on on the oh. ground. But as you say, we didn't have a clue that that was going to happen or what, you know, what, was, what was coming at all. So all the way through the film, the thing for us, the most important thing, was to keep on putting on camera what had just happened, why it was important, because in the next couple of days, the importance of it became really apparent. So we'd get stopped on our way to our hotel, we'd record it and we'd film it, because two days later, we'd no longer be able to leave the hotel. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of how we had to operate, just making sure that we covered everything that was happening, because you wouldn't realise the significance of it until later. I mean, it's a good example, though. So, I mean, we all, we, you know, risk assessment, obviously, we, is, is the phrase that we use over and over again on all of these, on all <laughs> of these films, isn't it? You know, you, you, I don't want to teach any of my grannies to suck eggs here, but um, uh, any, anybody that doesn't do an unbelievably thorough risk assessment for, to go to somewhere, um, uh, some of these places would be crazy. But, but you, you know, you can't risk assess for things that are unpredictable, can you? you no, know, you, you can't risk success for things that are unpredictable. It's also really important, I think, to pay attention to all the small things that people say mm. to you, which sometimes seem mm. not particularly relevant. The one that was said to us over and over again by journalists, <coughs> black, white, Ivorian, French, whoever, was that on the whole, a white face was really not helpful in Ivory mm. Coast at the time. Anybody with a white face was being surrounded, was being questioned repeatedly. We sort of assumed that a lot of these people had maybe not had that treatment before, or maybe their French wasn't good enough to deal with it. Maybe they hadn't worked in Africa, which is just notorious for, for mm. hassle. Um, it was quite arrogant of us, actually, because we got out there and <laughs> realised that these people were, in many cases, quite experienced journalists who had never experienced this level of hostility. None of us had, nobody had. Um, th there were times, you know, while we were out and about on the streets, I'd come back and I'd turn on the national news and my face and my director's face would be on, on the state broadcaster saying, if you see these people, they are lying journalists from oh the West, God. make sure you stop them. And I'm suddenly going, my God, this is why today has been such a nightmare. Everyone's just seen my face on TV and made a beeline for me. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really important to be honest with yourself about what you're being told, even if it seems very small, and to make sure it stays in your documents so that every time you come back to it, you can go, all right, 
this little thing mm. is actually much bigger. Like constantly reassessing. Mm. It's like we said earlier, sometimes they don't even have to necessarily say anything. It's just that look, like, and you're like, yeah. okay, you get the feeling, the yeah, feeling. in your gut. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, a lot of people we, we, we asked, um, for instance, you know, is it safe for Westerners? Mm. They always said yes. But what's really key is that they all paused for ages before yeah, that's saying, what I mean, yeah. you ignore the pause and then you move on. And it's the pause, actually, that was really important. That was, mm -hmm. the, it, it's not. But guaranteed. I think it's interesting what you said there as well about arrogance. Mm. And that was, that, that, that was some years ago now. And obviously you've built up a lot of experience since. Mm. And that was one of your first hostile environments. It was, yeah. Uh, uh, missions, really. Yeah, yeah. In, yeah. A, in at the deep end, as it, as it turned out. Um, and I know we certainly, and I think probably most people now, we, you know, when you're sending teams to these places, we insist, certainly at Channel 4, that um, you talk to at least half a dozen people that have, have been to that country, not a year ago and not six months ago, but actually in the last couple of weeks, because it's only the last couple of weeks that is relevant. Mm. You know, there's no, you know, when, when a, a situation like that is fast developing, there's no point talking to somebody that has been there six months ago. And also you need to speak to somebody who's got the same profile that you do. So mm. if it was, if it's two, two um, West Africans going, that's just completely useless for a, for a Western crew. And mm. I think that example really, really highlights all of those issues. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to move on to Becky. Speaking of, um, <laughs> yes, what you what you need to do, what you need to do in your risk assessment, and how it can be completely irrelevant whenever things suddenly develop in a, a take a twist that you're yeah. you're unaware of. Um, do you want to just uh, very? I know you've put together um, a clip and photographs. You don't have um, moving footage, obviously of. Uh, your experience, but do you want to give us a little overview of what it was that you went to do, what the project was that you went mm -hmm. to do in Indonesia, and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the arrest, and then we'll show the clip, and then we can um, delve into some of those issues. Sure. So um, I was directing a in investigative documentary in Indonesia, um, and we were looking at um, piracy in the Malacca Strait, which is a kind of little strip of water that runs between Malaysia and Indonesia and Singapore. And it's a really strategic area because it's kind of halfway between the Middle East and China, so all of the big fuel boats kind of um, go through this area. And so there are these little kind of floating petrol stations waiting to refuel them. And what's happening now is that gangs of pirates are kind of going and taking these entire boats, they're sailing them off and taking all of the fuel out of them and selling the fuel to basically Singaporean brokers. So we were covering this story traveling down through Malaysia and we were starting to develop a picture that it was very likely that the Indonesian Navy were complicit in some of these acts of piracy. So we knew that we had to go cover this story in Indonesia, we had to keep a very low profile to make sure that we weren't going to um, increase our risk in any way. But despite doing that, you know, despite keeping the cameras um, low, um, you know, keeping them in bags till the very last moment, um, and being very careful with where we filmed, um, we were out at sea one day um, filming with a pirate gang, and uh, the Indonesian Navy, <laughs> surprisingly, turned up, uh, you know, machine guns raised, torches in our faces um, and arrested us all. Uh, they took us back, um, threatened us with national security violations, um, weapons charges, all sorts of things, which amounted to around 22 years in prison. So um, at that point, I'm thinking, well, that's the rest of my life gone. <laughs> um, after that, they put us into house arrest and uh, didn't charge us for six weeks. So we had six weeks of unlawful detention there. Um, they charged us with a visa violation, and then we went into this kind of smoke and mirrors phase where we really had no idea what was going on. They weren't giving us any information. We didn't know if we were going to end up in prison for five years, uh, 10 years, 20 years. And that's when we heard this piece of radio from house arrest, um, which really kind of brought home to us just how serious our situation was, and that we unbeknownst to us, had kind of found ourselves in the middle of a political firestorm in the government. Um, so you can imagine hearing this on the radio when you're oh. facing prison, your stomach kind of falls through the floor a little bit. So I think it's fair to say that this is <laughs> everybody's absolute worst nightmare. Um, I mean, it's certainly my worst or one of my worst nightmares for um, teams that go off into the field and you, you always worry about it because by definition, <coughs> uh, 
um, you know, very often you're going to investigate things that governments don't want you to investigate, uh, and you can't necessarily get a journalist visa, and you know, you are going to rub up against authorities if you come into contact with them. So tell us what happened. Um, just give us a, a little bit of an outline of the, the, how things progressed. You were in hu under house arrest for uh, two and a half months. Exactly. And then you were transferred to an Indonesian prison. Exactly. So after that, pretty swiftly, um, we found out that we were going to be going into prison. Um, I mean, I was saying to you guys earlier, I'm a natural pessimist. So from the moment that we were arrested, I was thinking, you know, worst case scenario the whole time, thinking we probably will be going to prison at some point. Um, but what that, at that moment, what really was brought to light was that, you know, the military, who were obviously the ones who were angry at us about this film, were really tussling in government with the um, president. And that meant that we were a bit of a prize that was being fought over. If they could get us into prison, um, that would mean that we could be a billboard to every other journalist, you know, don't come sniffing around mm -hmm. Indonesia. Um, and it was really f trying to find out who is going to win in this battle. Um, so after that, after we kind of discovered that, yeah, we were sent to prison. Um, we were taken to a majority male prison. Um, my colleague was um, put into the male section. I was in kind of a female wing. Um, and, you know, we really didn't know how much we were going to see each other. Um, in fact, before we went into prison, we, the week before we left, we talked about getting married <laughs> so that we could, um, you know, potentially have more visitor time together because we'd be husband and wife. Um, it was kind of that survival instinct. Um, it weren't quite that desperate. Yeah, yeah it yeah. got that desperate. <laughs> I was going to marry Neil. So, um, <laughs> so um, we got into prison, and you know, it was it was an Indonesian prison. It was dirty. It was scary. It was dark. We didn't have the language. The guards were very, um, you know, they were very much in control, and they would play kind of games with you. Um, but after we got in there, um, we were kind of summoned to the office of the guy that runs the prison, who told us that um, there was going to be a competition for the best prison in Indonesia, and he wanted a short film made um, in the prison, <laughs> demonstrating just how wonderful his prison was. I um, can help you. <laughs> yeah, I have those skills, um, but I will remind you that I am in prison because I was filming in Indonesia. <laughs> um, so we ended up making this very surreal and bizarre documentary, um, exploring how wonderful the prison that we were being held in was. Um, and so that actually you know, gave me a lot of time with Neil, um, a lot of time to kind of laugh about our situation, which was really important. You, know, you can find yourself in these traumas, but if you can laugh at it, then you'll find a way to survive. Um, and we were there for about two and a half months. Um, the trial kind of dragged out over that time, so uh, there was a lot of media interest, a lot of kind of paparazzi scrums, and they found us uh, guilty, so I'm now a convicted criminal, um, but we were released um, with time served, so we came home to our families in November. Incredible ordeal. Um, looking back on it now, how did the risk assessment and the preparation that you had done before you went um, help you and hinder you? What would you do differently and what were you actually really glad that you did do? Sure. So, I mean, the thing really that was missing and made quite clear by the radio clip was that we'd missed the macro political situation. So we'd phoned uh, journalists that had um, worked in Indonesia, um, both Indonesian and British journalists um, to ask their advice on, um, you know, should we go in with a visa and, you know, risk our contributors being caught by the government because you're kind of paired up with a minder when you go to make these films? Um, or do we go in without and risk, um, you know, being deported? And the consensus was go without. What we didn't do was to phone up a human rights organization or a political activist, uh, people on the ground, like you're saying, you know, that know what happened a week mm. ago to say, actually, it's a very strange time. There's a kind of battle going on in government right now. And if you fall into the middle of that, there's a chance you're going to become a political football. So it would have given us more information to say, OK, well, now we know the consequences. Um, are we still going to take that risk? Is that, am I still comfortable with that boundary? Um, the things that worked, you know, we had a very good check-in procedure. So. I'm sure there are lots of filmmakers here kind of familiar with the idea if you go into a hostile situation, say you're interviewing a drug dealer or you're going out on a boat with some pirates, you check in back with 
the team in London or wherever your team is. This is likely going to take three hours. I'm going to check back out with you after three hours. If I don't do that, then there's a kind of series of actions that gets put into place, first of all. They try to find out where you are. If that doesn't you know, prove any results after a little while, then you know, please get called. The FCO gets involved. Um, they found phone around hospitals. So that worked well because immediately after we were arrested, we were able to get messages back to um, wall to wall. And you, and you mentioned the FCO there. I mean, overall, in your case, because we always have them, we always have their out of hours number on our contact list, the Foreign Office, you know, what to do yeah. in an emergency. I mean, to what extent did they ride to the rescue or not? Um, I think that the FCO can be a very positive support. Um, and in different countries around the world, they're going to have different amount of influence. Um, but generally, with the FCO, they will be as passive as they can afford to be. Um, and we definitely found that with them. They were very passive. They did not recognize that our case was political. Um, they didn't afford me protections as a female in a male prison um, in the form of advice. Um, the thing that made them really up their game was getting in contact with um, my MP, Harriet Harman, back in London, who then put pressure on their bosses, who in turn put pressure on them. As soon as that happened, you know, we were getting more phone calls, we were getting more responses, we were getting more advice. So if you are in a situation like that, go back to London, put the pressure on there, and then you know, hopefully they'll step their game up. Otherwise, I mean, they'll send out the stock message, we are dealing with the situation. Yeah, so you've got to stay, people here at this end have really got to stay on. They've on them. It's huge, the difference in... But actually response. MPs as well, your local MP, your local MP yeah, is the key. Yeah, totally, you know, um, you, can, you can talk to your MP about, you know, an issue if you're jailed abroad or any kind of issue abroad. Um, they can bring that up in a private way by going to meet ministers in government, or they can stand up in the commons and, you know, make a really big deal, which could be picked up by the press, depending on what kind of help you need. They're so useful, so useful. And one of the issues we were talking about earlier was um, that you had thought through in, a, in advance was what happens to your rushes, because that's obviously key whenever you get picked up like that. Um, you know, you have to have some sort of strategy for hiding or getting rid of your rushes. How did that work? I mean, and what difference would it have made if you had been caught with yeah, them? So, um, Actually, we filmed a lot of um, very contentious stuff all the way through Malaysia and in Indonesia. Um, we had a kind of a system set up by which we were able to make sure that those rushes didn't fall into the authorities' hands. Um, and that's something that you should really think about before you go into any kind of hostile environment, any kind of investigative documentary, especially if it's to do with authorities and investigation. Um, I think it's just really important to understand that rushes become evidence and you need to understand them as a very powerful thing that can be used against you. So having that idea that you have trusted people in place locally that can get those rushes out for you um, or you, you know, work entirely electronically uploading to an FTP server or other secure site so that you don't have those physical rushes there that can then, you know, you know, if, if they had found our rushes, I'm sure they could, they could have opened us up to far more serious charges than they brought against us. Mm. Well, I mean, we do, th we do that as well on the border, don't we? You've done mm. that before where you've, where you've yeah. um, I think the, la the last time was in Zimbabwe, where you make sure that it was actually every day or every two days. Yeah, every day. Getting them we took Every day we took them. the hard drive over and then had to get it sort of copied over, and that was a, sort of the dangerous half hour, 45 minutes when you're like, oh, we're all here in one room. <laughs> with all the evidence. But then, yeah, doing that on a daily basis kind of really takes the pressure off you when you've had a really big interview or someone said something quite contentious and then end of the day you sort of offload it. Um, building up a good re relationship with FedEx um, in a lot of other countries as well. Yes. Where whichever town you go into, you phone up your guy in the capital and he goes, oh, speak to so-and-so. And then you go off and you're constantly getting FedEx things FedExed from the middle of nowhere back. But it just takes so much huge yeah. weight off you. I think um, actually what it does as well is it frees you up to film. It lets you yeah. be able to do more because yeah. you don't, you're not carrying stuff around with you that would get you into real trouble. You're starting from, from fresh every fresh couple of time. days as well. Right. And I think that 
a lot of people, particularly whenever they first start, start making documentaries in these areas, think that these processes are completely ludicrous and over, over the top. But obviously, you would yeah. disagree with They're that. They're over the top yeah. until, you know, the shit hits the fan. And then they're really great and you, you want to, you know, you want to have had those processes in place yeah. the whole yeah. time. Such a relief as well. Like, a couple of times, you know, we've been pulled over by authority figures and they've said, let me see the tape, show me the tape. Mm. And, you know, we've, we've been filming GVs for half an hour before and I've been like... <laughs> Oh, it's just a tree, it's yeah. just a tree. <laughs> so yeah, the idea of like sort of starting fresh every day is, is really worth it's, Yeah, fantastic method. A lot of cameras have uh, two card slots as well, and so uh, quite common tech, uh, tactic used by directors I've worked with is to have your GV's card in there at all times. And then if you're ever stopped, you only have to remove show one them. and yeah. show them yeah. the other. Lots of wildlife um, pictures. <laughs> lots yeah. of wildlife pictures. In fact, I've done that on, on two or three, quite a few occasions. And, and in Ivory Coast, our, our film in Ivory Coast ended with us sort of being accosted and beaten up by um, some security who wanted to look at our footage. Mm. Um, actually, they wanted to take away our footage, so we were able to simply hand over a card and know that it, it's not got anything good on it because mm. we've all the good stuff's gone. Yeah. Stacey, you have um, you have chosen for your first clip an um, uh, uh, excerpt from Sex and Strange Places whenever you travelled to Turkey. Why did you pick this clip? The reason I picked this particular clip um, is because on paper, I think I have been to far more hostile environments. For example, I've been to the Ivory Coast, I've been to Malaysia, I've been to Indonesia, and actually they've been you know, pretty uneventful for me. Um, so I wanted to show that in a place like Turkey, which you know you wouldn't necessarily sort of fill yourself with dread over. Um, even just following actuality or certain contribs can put you in a position or a situation where you're suddenly thinking, actually, this has now become a bit more hostile. And what um, was the what was the story that you went to do? So essentially, we went there um, to follow lots of really cool prostitutes. Actually, I really loved all of the sex workers, all really awesome characters. Um, and the majority of the film was based in Istanbul. Um, there was a bit in Ankara, there'd been a bomb, but, you know, nothing to, um, nothing to worry about too much. Um, but then I had found, whilst being on the ground, that there were lots of Syrian women. Obviously, you know, they'd fled Syria and they were here now. And I, and I wanted to follow that a bit more. That, that I found really fascinating. Um, so we were back and forth with the office. Um, and we said that we believed there were Syrian women who were being forced into prostitution and being expected to behave like sex workers because they had no other option. Um, there were two girls that were willing to have a chat with us, but they were based in uh, Gaziantep, which is far closer to Syria um, than we'd ever planned on going to. Um, so, yeah, we were there a couple of days, in and out. It was fairly straightforward, fairly quick. But, you know, we had been warned, you know, there were ISIS cells there, there were people there that, you know, catching a kind of transparent white um, <laughs> Westerner, you know, that had been rubbing their hands in glee. Um, so yeah, that's why I picked this particular clip. We'll watch the clip and then yeah. we'll talk about it. Thank you. Thanks. Very, very brave ladies. Huh? Yeah, they were awesome, actually. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting what you said, you know, Turkey is not necessarily somewhere that people think of as a hostile environment in a traditional sense. And also, I think it's difficult whenever you're going somewhere where nothing has happened yet. Yeah. Now, obviously, there had been two journalists killed there, but they were, they were Syrian journalists, and it was yeah. quite a specific thing. No Westerners had been harmed in that town. So in one sense, that can give you a sense of, a, a, a sense of satisfaction. We're OK to go yeah. here. But because it hasn't happened so far, it doesn't mean that it that it won't. That's it. You know, it's those borderline places are actually very, very difficult to risk assess, aren't they? Yeah, I, th I think you're right. And, you know, I th like you say, on paper, Turkey, you know, when I knew I was going to Turkey, I, I definitely wasn't scared. You know, I've um, travelled a lot of Africa, DRC, Honduras, you know, all these places that you, you should, you know, rightly so, you should be nervous about going to. Um, so when it became apparent that we had the opportunity to go and meet these girls, you do suddenly think, don't you, oh, 30 miles from Syria, you know, and, and these lads, you know, they, they had just been killed um, for covering essentially the, the same story that we were, tr you know, we were trying to tell. Um, but it's like you say, you know, you kind of assess the situation and you weigh up the pros and cons and you think, actually, I really want to give the girls this platform, you know, they were desperate to talk. Um, yeah. 
And there's a lot of issues in there, actually, of not just about safety to you and the crew, but about safety to them particularly. Exactly. How do you deal with that? I think that's one of the most important things. And, you know, as I go on throughout my career, that's something that is very important to me personally. You know, we always focus on us because, you know, our lives are so important and, you know, you want to come home at the end of the day. But our fixers are, as we all know, the unsung heroes. And the lad that went and picked them up, he had to drive a couple of hours. And, it, you know, there are, there are ISIS representatives there. And, and if they'd have found out where he was going and who they were going to collect and, you know, bringing them to the BBC, you know, he, he would have absolutely been in lots of trouble. And likewise with the girls, you know, they really wanted to tell their side of the story because they've had such a horrific time. I mean, things you can't even begin to imagine have happened to them. Um, so you hope that, you know, I mean, obviously they weren't their names and you hope that you've given them the time and the space and they feel comfy and confident that they've said their bit, but, you know, they feel comfortable to go home and they won't get attacked on the way back. Yeah. Shay, you had, a, you had one of those um, uh, films recently, didn't you, where mm. you went somewhere that you thought was actually mm. going to be relatively safe mm. yeah. and it turned out to be yeah, yeah, yeah. more, f feel more more hostile to you than some of the war zones yeah. that you'd been Well, often if I'm doing my job right, that, that happens <laughs> yeah. almost every film at some stage. But yeah, I mean, we went off to Chicago to make a film about gang violence. And um, obviously, gang violence is, is very present, it's very real, lots of people die, but none of them are journalists, none of them are anybody other than the gangsters who are involved in it in the first place. So there's this very easy, quick route to, to being a little bit arrogant and a little bit mm -hmm. complacent and going, well, sure, it's dangerous, but it's not dangerous for people like me, so off I go and I mm -hmm. do my thing. Um, having been in a number of, of different hostile environments, I quickly yep. recognised all, the, all the, sort of the symptoms, all the, the lack of control, the lack of information, um, the randomness with which things happen. Sure, a journalist hadn't been killed, but that was just by chance, actually. Mm -hmm. They just hadn't happened to be standing in front of a bullet. Um, a three-year-old had been killed. Nobody meant to kill him. <laughs> and I could have easily been stood where he was. And so over the weeks, it started to really grate on us. Um, just chipped away at your confidence. You'd hear some gunshots in a road that you'd just come from, and it was totally dead and quiet when you were there. And you suddenly go, God, a dead, quiet road isn't necessarily fine yeah. in this area. Mm -hmm. Shall um, we see a clip from it? Yeah. Should we see the Chicago clip, please? We, um, I, mean, I, 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 remember, I remember you saying to me, it's like being in a war zone, but you don't know where the bullets are coming from, yeah. that you don't know where they're going to come from next. So mm. um, what, what are your sort of tips, if you like? To how in that situation do you try and keep yourself safe? Okay, what do well you do? The main thing, and, and this is, I suppose, where, where <laughs> experience helped me, was that I tried to recreate what I'd had in war zones, in dangerous situations, but in Chicago. So... For instance, in Ivory Coast, I had the United Nations press office I could ring all the time. I had the French Army press office I could call all the time. I had the, uh, the Foreign Office. I had a couple of local journalists. And so I tried to recreate that in Chicago. Um, the Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times, um, a couple of the black um, websites and who were kind of quite active on the ground, NGOs that support victims of crime. So they go around to someone's house the day after the dad's been shot, and they go and mm -hmm. say to the mum, you know, do you need anything else? Getting in with all these people so that they could tell me what was going on, where, and what might be a problem um, in, different, in different places. Just trying to recreate the, the infrastructure that kept me safe mm -hmm. um, in other places. The thing that really jumps out for me watching that again, and it was, we, we, we struggled a lot on, that on how to present it to people, um, I didn't see a gun. I didn't see the, the boy in that particular incident turn around with a gun, but I knew he had one. Mm. I knew that he was on edge. I knew that he was in the middle of a gang war. And so when he saw me, when he clocked me and he jumped, I didn't need to wait to see a gun because I'd listened to him, the, the actual boy in, 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 in the shot there, all his mates, and Lee, the, the violence interrupter who I was working with, to know that in these situations, you don't think. You pull out, you shoot a few shots. Yeah. If they were after you, they'll zoom off. If they weren't, <laughs> they'll probably freeze. And, and, and either way, you shoot first and then you ask questions yeah. later. So I could see the look in his eye and I knew that that meant You needed shots to get away coming. quickly. And we recognised that a few, few more times, um, yeah, as we were going around. You, as I say, 
the worst thing we could have done there was wind down the window, I think. We'd, we'd already done enough. We'd pulled up slowly, we'd peered out the window. The guy's thinking, who are they? Once the window starts coming down, he has no option but to pull out and shoot. Yeah. And so you have to understand the rules of where you are. Don't but think it's incredible, because that, that violence the instructor, that's the only way he can do his job, is by approaching them, right? So yeah. how does he, how, you know, he's in a catch-22 there, isn't he? If he, he doesn't is, approach he them, the violence continues, yes, then yet he has to put himself in incredible danger and exactly. in order to do um, it. And yeah. it's really important to, 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 to listen to people like him, understand what risks he takes, but also understand if those risks are appropriate for you. Yeah. Um, they're when I was there, they called it Chirac. Like, yeah. all the lads on the street mm -hmm. were like, this is Chirac. Like, I'm not going to wait to see if he's got a gun. Mm. And you're so right. Like, the relationships are just so necessary. We got Pally with the church, like, mm -hmm. the leader of the church, because church good, it's the yeah. only place they won't really shoot. Totally. It's like you're saying as well, the you don't have to see the gun. Often in those mm. situations, um, you've got to trust the feeling you get right here. Yeah. You see the guy, you see another guy here, you get a feeling about this person here, and then it all mm. comes together in this feeling. I yeah. got it when I was watching this, just yeah, yeah. that gut feeling. And you, if you don't trust that, it's also you you've got be to pick between. You've got to pick between the lines. Lee kept on pointing out that these boys drive a BMW, which meant nothing to me. But the way that it works for, for these kids on the street is you'll get higher, you'll get you know, higher purchase, whatever, you'll get a loan to buy the car. The more money you think you're going to make selling drugs, the, m the bigger, better car you'll get. So they're driving around in a convertible BMW. They're very confident. They have a patch where they make a very large amount mm. of money every week, and they know they're getting that. And the only way he's going to guarantee his car payment for next week is to shoot the guy yeah. who tries to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. And so he's operating at a very high level, whereas I've met lots of gangsters who are who don't even drive, they're mm. on the bus. Mm. This guy's not going to shoot me. He's got a lot less to lose. He's not as, as involved. Yeah. And so you can hang out with that guy for a bit longer. Whereas with those kids, I couldn't spend mm. more than an hour with them. Mm -hmm. I knew that someone was after them. Mm -hmm. Stacey, it's, um, it's a mistake that people sometimes make, isn't it? Thinking that danger zones or hostile environments are only in war zones or yeah. only over there. Um, and actually, you know, Chicago can be just as dangerous, if not. I mean, I was so amazed to get that email mm. from you saying it's probably the most scariest thing you've ever done, you know, yeah. after everything you've done. You um, did a project here yep. in your own hometown <laughs> yeah. in Luton. Yes. That turned out, um, you know, had lots of issues and turned out to be really quite a dangerous project for you, didn't it, it in is, some ways? It's mental, isn't it? You're right. Like, I've been to all these really frightening, scary places. And whenever I go there, I tell my mum I'm elsewhere, you know. <laughs> I get myself in a tears before and I feel panicky, but I think, no, I absolutely want to do this. And uh, like we spoke about earlier, there was a certain arrogance on my part. And I was going back to Luton, where I'm from. I know everyone in Luton. You know, it was like, I'm returning to my hood. This is my <laughs> patch. Leave it to me. Um, but because I, I think the subjects... You know, it doesn't matter where you sit, what side of the fence you're what was on. The subject? Everyone's so passionate. It's about sort of the far right, so the EDL, um, who I grew up with, the leader of the EDL, and the Al Mahad Jaroon. So, you know, a few sort of Islamic militants, and I, I knew the leader of, of that group as well. So I was in this kind of unique position, um, and I, I totally underestimated what it would mean. I think as well, it kind of taught me the respect that is necessary for the fixers because. You know, when I was walking through the Arndale three months later, six months later, there were people coming up to me, yeah. you know, you, you white whore, um, you Muslim lover, you know, throwing things at me. My mum works in the Arndale, mm. you know, I had the local press going in asking my mum for quotes, mm. you know, about such huge topics like migration and religion. Um, and, and yeah, I, 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 should, I, I learned a lot from doing Luton. Because you would yeah. never really want people that you're investigating in Turkey to know where That's you it. live. They all and know yeah, where I live. They, know. they know where I live. They know where my family lives. They know where my mother works. And, you know, these aren't Mickey Mouse characters. These are people who are willing to die in their words mm -hmm. for their cause, for their message. Um, so, yeah, weirdly, randomly, Luton was probably one of, if not the trickiest for me. Let's see a clip, yeah. please. <laughs> So embarrassing. Interesting experience there. there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I learned a lot from that as well because now I like to think, because um, I'm very highbrow, <laughs> now I make serious <laughs> docs, so that I wouldn't kind of react in the same way, but she really pissed me off. Yeah. <laughs> when was that? Yeah, it was a couple of years ago, three or four years ago for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, 
I'm aware that we need to crack on with a Q&A quite soon. Mm -hmm. So, um, Becky, I just want to come to you. You've chosen a really interesting clip because a lot of what we're talking about has been about violence or political unrest or some of the um, some of the state s issues around state and violence. But you have chosen um, a, a clip which is more concerned with um, the contributors' safety and what you need to know about your rights in relation to contributors. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So. Um, I was directing a doc in um, Salt Lake City in Utah, which is a heavily Mormon um, community, and I was looking at the drugs trade that operates in the church there. And I knew that kind of opiates were a problem because um, prescription painkillers are usually the first chance that um, someone who's Mormon will come into contact with any kind of substance, which is pretty mind-blowing when you don't even drink coffee. So um, we were following um, a story of a woman we met called Danica, and Danica had grown up in a Mormon household and um, had gotten into heroin when she was a teenager. So we spent a, a couple of weeks getting to know Danica, uh, spending time with her, you know, when she was high, when she wasn't, when she was in a good mood, when she wasn't, really working through um, what it meant for her to um, be in this documentary and the consequences it could have. And when we decided that, you know, it was a good decision to begin filming with her, we followed her to pick up some heroin from her usual spot and then went back to a hotel room um, with her that had been paid for by her partner um, to film her and talk with her as she used her drugs. Um, and kind of after injecting, it became apparent um, that Danica's drugs were a lot stronger than she thought that they were and the clip kind of shows um, and documents what happens when somebody does that, uses heroin that's much stronger than they used to. I never like watching that. So I guess the question there is, um, or one of the big questions is at what point you intervene. intervene. You know, you, it's absolutely massive, massive problem, um, heroin addiction in the States. You want to document it properly, fine. But <laughs> A, how do you know when to intervene us, and how do you recognize mm -hmm. when somebody is overdosing? Oh. And ethically, how long can you wait until you get the shot that you need to say, this is what heroin does to people? Exactly. What? It's. I mean, that's exactly, it's a complete tightrope. So what was going through my mind then was, um, this is the reality of drug addiction. This is what happens. Um, fluctuating quality of heroin kills people. That's the bottom line. That's why people die. So it was very important for me to manage to get this story um, while making sure my contributor was as safe as possible. So this was edited in, in a way that um, it kind of cuts out basically me saying every 10 seconds, Danica, are you okay? Danica, are you okay? Danica, are you okay? Mm. And um, you know, telling me, yes, yes, I'm, I'm just, this is very, very strong. I'm, and then slipping out again. So. Um, at that point, when I made that documentary, I'd made about six or seven, I'd produced and directed six or seven documentaries looking at the drug trade and, do and documenting the drug trade. So um, on a personal level, I was very comfortable being around people who were using heroin. I'd spent time filming, talking with, spending time with people that were using. Um, and so I knew the kind of um, things that were happening to her. I could recognize the way her body was moving, the way that she was breathing. Um, I knew that the second I didn't get that, yes, I'm still here. I was picking up the phone and I was calling 911. Who, who were you with? Were you on your own or were you with somebody else? I was with my producer, um, a woman called Jo, and a sound guy, a guy called Evo. Okay, so um, there were three of you. There was three and of us. What, what happened next? I'm sure. Everybody... So, yeah, she's okay. <laughs> she's yeah. fine. Um, she um, kept nodding in and out of consciousness, which is what happens, as she said, um, when you do a strong shot, um, heroin users often really like that. That's something that is a really pleasurable feeling. You feel very nice and light and relaxed, and you kind of drift in and out of this heavy sleep. Um, but yeah, it's true. If you, if you lose consciousness, you can forget to breathe, and so that is how you die as a, as a heroin user. Um, would, you I, have, would, you, would you have known what to do? I mean, had you training in any way? Did you? I knew that there was a drug called Narcan that can be used where um, it can be sprayed into the back of the throat. And I discussed with the production company having that on us at all times, but they were worried about liability, um, mm -hmm. which they shouldn't have been. I should have just had that. And looking back, I probably would have included that. Um, 
So yeah, it's a very, it's a very easy drug to get. Um, I mean, that's a big issue in the States, isn't it? Particularly massive. liability and uh, <coughs> intervening and then being held liable for mm -hmm. some and of it's these. The, it's that line as a filmmaker of, um, you know, do you yeah. intervene? Do you become medical, you know, staff at that moment? What I did know is that there's a very um, robust, at, we'd just been filming with the EMS in the area, so we knew that they were very robust service. Um, they got to stuff very quickly. We also knew that we were protected by what is called the Good Samaritan Law, um, which is enacted across around 30 states in the US, which says that if you phone up when someone's overdosing, you're immune from charges of possession and a possession of paraphernalia, which is you know, a very real risk. It doesn't matter that you're a journalist. If you are there with a drug user or a yeah. drug dealer, you well, that was Well, that with. was actually going to be my next question, is do you, you know, what if you set aside what happened uh, with her with medically, what would have happened if the police had come in the door at that point? I mean, right. we, so many films are made about drugs, but what mm -hmm. actually, you know, you're, you're putting yourself legally totally. in danger? Totally. I mean, if you think about, if we took the scenario of something a bit more serious, the times I've been in a room with a heroin dealer that has a kilo of heroin on the table and a big stack of cash. Um, if somebody comes into the room at that point, I could be charged with, you know, felony possession. Um, if I have arranged to meet that person in the hotel room with that stuff, I could be charged with trafficking. And these are the kind of, you know, charges that you're going to spend years and years mm -hmm. in prison. So I think it's, again, this fine line of kind of risk management. There's a risk of, you know, the drug dealer doing something nasty to me, so I should meet in a neutral location. But there's also the risk that the police could be monitoring us and we'll be swept up in a drugs case and yeah. jailed. So, you know, where do you want to lie in that? Do you want to minimise the risk from the drug dealer or do you want to minimise the risk from the police? Mm. And it's this constant, you know, assessing what's the worst case scenario here and where's your boundary? Where do you want it to, where do you want it to lie? It's like a battle within yourself as well, isn't it? Yeah. Because you want to, you know, stick to your guns and stay true to your morals. And when you're filming people taking drugs, it's you, I find myself sort of back and forth the entire time. Are they doing this because we're here or are they doing this because they genuinely behave like this? Yeah, It's totally. so hard. It's really hard and especially with vulnerable contributors. Yeah, the which they often are. They so always, I mean, someone dealing with an addiction, it's a mental health condition. So you have to respect the fact that they may not know what they're getting into and it's your duty mm -hmm. as a filmmaker to inform them of that. And, you know, continuously checking in with consent, it's a flexible thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. They may consent on the Monday, you film yeah. with them on the Tuesday, Wednesday they don't want to do it anymore. You don't put them in that movie. Mm. That will affect them for the rest of their life. Mm. Yeah. Also yeah. making decisions, uh, sometimes having to make decisions for them about consent, yeah. knowing what that means and mm. what that's likely to mean and really having to spell out which is which is difficult because you're trying to keep somebody on board but you're constantly having to spell out to them that this might happen the police might see this that might happen you know uh, and yeah. try to keep them on board while making sure they know the truth totally. yeah. i'd like to um i'd like to throw it open to um questions please if i may um i don't know if we've got if we've got a microphone or if you just want to shout hi over here yeah hi oh, yeah When you've been in uh, really terrifying situations, of, as, as you have, um, what is it that um, makes you go back, essentially? Um, obviously, you've been very thorough about the risk assessment, but I think I'm referring more to the internal decisions in your own mind. Like, it, I mean, once you've been in prison for five months, but you still, <laughs> that's not enough to stop you doing the next film kind of thing. What? No. It's, it's that I kind of <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what makes me want to go back? Um, I think as a filmmaker, you have a massive privilege to platform people that don't have voices. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking with Stacey about this earlier, actually. Going through prison um, was a horrific experience. It was. It was also a valuable experience. Um, I'm lucky enough that I had a voice. I mean, I'm sitting in front of you today. I can talk about that. But the people that I was with can't. Um, there are people all over the world that can't talk about this. So um, I find it to be a privilege that I can go into the world and I can and find those stories and I'm able to elevate those people's voices. And it's something that I don't want to give up so easily. Um, I, d I think also, you know, as I said, it was a very traumatic experience what happened. More so for my friends and family, really. But 
it also had a aspects of valuableness. It was massively eye-opening. Um, it was, you know, taught me so much about myself and mm. about other people and bravery. And I want to take those lessons on. I want to keep going. Yeah. Stacey, do you think a time's going to come mm. where you are going to say enough is in? I, 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 it, I'm, f I'm too worried each time I go now. Um, yeah, we, we were talking earlier, and I said, I think uh, where I started years ago, I mean, it's no secret, I sort of fell into it, and I fell into these kind of current affairs -y issues, and I didn't have any real fear. I wasn't frightened, I was just very gobby. <laughs> opinion, opinion, opinion. But now, you know, when you travel the world and you find yourself in these really scary, really frightening, hostile environments, you do think twice. Um, I wouldn't go to Syria at the minute. Um, I, I would, I would, I mean, <laughs> I mean, but you know, meeting them girls, I, I, I do think you're right, it's so important to give people a voice. I just echo that completely. So I, you know, I kind of go back and forth with myself. But yeah, I think there are a few I places think that's I wouldn't normal. go. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, over here at the back. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so picking up on something Stacey said about the scariest thing being in Luton. Um, I mean, I guess to all of you, when you get into a story which is so close to home, yeah. and once you've made that film and you've made enemies and they live next door to your mum, um, I mean, does that make you... Is that what keeps you doing stories abroad? And do you have appetite to make these really difficult stories at home that, that need to be made, but perhaps have more of a personal cost on you uh, yeah, no, long you're, afterwards? You're completely right. And I think that's why I was so keen to do Luton. I mean, I pitched Luton because I felt like, you know, if I've got it about me to go around the world and start pointing fingers and start saying, you know, this isn't good, you're not behaving well, I kind of owe it. <laughs> to, to the people who I've, you know, um, hung out with in foreign countries to actually look at, look at what's happening in my hometown and be willing to take on, you know, board uh, the repercussions and, and the situations that will arise having done that. Um, it's tricky, like two of them lads that are in that clip are now in prison. Um, and Anjum Chowdhury, who I had a conversation with, um, has voiced numerous times... Um, what his opinions are of me. But I'm, I'm, I'm not frightened of um, standing up for what I believe in. I, I mean, I sound like Mother Teresa here, but I'm not. <laughs> and I think it's very important. And I think, you know, you know, we live in a country where women do have a voice, and I'm, I'm going to continue to use that. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, somebody just here, there in the end with the glasses? Hi, yeah, my question, oh, my question is, uh, I guess for all of you, um, whether you are relying more on your role as a journalist or a filmmaker and how you see the kind of interaction of the dual roles. Um, and also in terms of your skills, first of all, but also your self-perception and how it affects your access as well. Uh, sorry, when you say your our self Sorry, what, the second question, could you, could you clarify? So, so that's all one question with three subparts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, let's... Let the third subpart. So do, you wanna, do you want to just take the first one first? Are sure. you more of a journalist or more of a filmmaker? Um, and where does the balance God, oh lie? That's a extraordinarily, it's a, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary question. Extraordinarily yeah. difficult um, question. I mean, uh, I, I'll be completely, brutally honest that I've never seen a difference between the two. It may simply because I didn't study journalism, but for me, you know, if you're if you're doing good journalism, making a good film, <laughs> if you're aiming to make a really good film, and you're going through the processes properly and thinking about it all, and thinking about your contributors and thinking about the editorial decisions, then yeah, you're doing. A I good think film. it's fair to say as well, none of you operate in vacuums, do you? No. So you're always <laughs> working with other people who, you know, see so your role might be more journalist or more filmmaker, depending that who the other people that you're working exactly. with on any particular project, I presume? I mean, I, I definitely don't see myself as a journalist. Um, I'm afraid you yeah. might have become one. I don't oh! Yeah, no. Um, I, I definitely don't see myself as a journalist. You know, I left school at 15. I didn't study journalism, so it definitely wasn't kind of a straight road for me. Um, but I am passionate about, you know, the contri you know, the contributors and the people that you knock about with and their stories. Um, and so I think I 
do make good films. Um, but yeah, I would never describe myself as a journalist. But you know, you know what it takes to make a good film now. For because sure, I do now. Yeah, I'm learning all the while. But yeah, I, I do now. Sure. Becky? I think um, to kind of say something a bit different, it's that, um, again, I feel like both and that that was a great answer. Not really much of a distinction, but just that... Um, it's more like being a type of journalist. So you're carrying around cameras. Immediately, you're more visible than a print journalist. Immediately, you're opening yourself up to more risk because, again, the rushes are evidence. You know, they can literally see exactly what you've seen um, you know, if authorities catch you. So it's just recognizing that you are a very special type of journalist and that there are certain risks and benefits attached to that. Mm. Personally, I feel that filmmaking, you can platform people and literally give them a voice because you put them on screen with their voice. As a print journalist, you know, you're doing fantastic work and often can get maybe a little bit deeper access, but you um, retell with a lot of kind of, of mm. words of your own as well. And um, different think, styles yeah. work in different, sorry, different styles work in different situations. Like, you know, there, there have been times where I've been filming in a prison um, and even things like your accent or your sex or, you know, your turn of phrase, they, they can yeah, totally. decide, totally. you know, which contributor decides to open up mm. to what member of the team. Yeah, without a doubt, without yeah. a doubt. Well, I, think that I think probably everybody and um, sort of output that we're talking about, the way it differs from conventional journalism or, or news is that what we're always looking for is characters, isn't it? It's people mm. who you really, really get to know in the content that you tell the stories through them rather than in a more superficial way that we would, would mm. in journalism. Do you mind if I go on to somebody else because uh, there's lots of hands up there. This lady here straight ahead. Um, hello, yeah. First of all, I just want to say thank you very much for this extraordinary panel. It, I think I speak for everyone here that what you do demands a whole lot of respect. Uh, my question is, um, well, um, all of you, you operate within a system with a, a lot of support uh, from uh, Channel 4, and, and uh, a lot of us here are completely independent filmmakers who also have a story to tell. And what I'm facing personally cur currently is trying to find funding in a story that I can't really blurt out to the world, <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, secondly, you, you all talked about um, uh, s talking to other journalists and other people who have been in those countries. And as independent people, we might not have access to those people. And what would you advise independent filmmakers? I mean, I, I, sorry, I'm going to leap in on that. I think you can always have access to a degree. I mean, you can. We what we find generally is that people are, on the whole. I mean, obviously, there's arseholes that don't want to share any information about <laughs> security, but generally, people are actually really generous. If you say that you're doing a security assessment and you want to know to look after your, in order to look after your own safety, so you know you can go through and find out who the who the stringer for the Times is there, who the you know who, who the local what well, the local newspaper journalist is, and I think people will be quite open to freelance filmmakers phoning them up for those sorts of security assessments. I don't know anybody yeah, else. Yeah, definitely, think. the whole thing works because we because we talk to each other, and it, mm -hmm. it stops working if we don't. So don't don't feel um, like you don't have the right or whatever. Whether it's mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter, you know, people do respond. Um, I respond people have responded to me, I feel more that I should respond because people respond to me. So just ask, and, mm. um, and if we can, yeah. people will email you back. Well, Especially with social media now, like it's so much easier. Like Shay and I were in Brazil at the same mm. time last year, and we were messaging, what's the story, what's the situation? And actually, a mutual <laughs> friend tweeted me about Becky's situation, and but, you know, so yeah, we're, we're a lot sort of handier now with, with that. I would suggest with your, um, I'm guessing it's kind of a sensitive story that um, if you're pitching to, um, to funds and things like that, you can approach them first and talk about sensitivity and they can potentially set up a secure box that you can drop into. Um, I think, you know, building up that relationship with them and saying, I don't want this to be discussed with anyone else, but there are definitely ways to develop communication lines that are confidential and secure um, to, to kind of approach people. And if it's and if it's something that is really really sensitive, then you can get people to sign a non-disclosure agreement as well before you go into detailed conversations with them. Um, this is here at the front. Hi, thanks. Um, I've got two questions as well. Um, first of all, when you're going out on these trips and you are assessing your risk and all of that, how do you involve your families? How <laughs> afraid are they? And how do you how do you make them afraid? Because I've got I've got one <laughs> at home who's very afraid. Um, uh. And secondly, especially for the two women, 
Um, as a woman out there, um, I've been filming in Ghana and Ivory Coast as well, and I feel like as a woman, how I'm always looking for inspiring white women um, doing this job because it's just so much harder. And I wonder how do you cope with that, or what are your tips? I'm going to um, I'm going to ask Stacey to tell you about her unique strategy of dealing with the family thing. First <laughs> of all, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, no, you're, you're completely right. And, and, you know, when when you take the gig, you know, you're made up that they've asked you. And like we've said a thousand times, it's a total privilege. But then I think, oh, I've got to ring my mum. I've got to ring my mum and tell her that I'm off to Mexico to film with the Sinaloa cartel um, where loads <laughs> of journalists have just oh. been killed. Luckily, and this sounds awful, my mother sort of doesn't work. You know, sh she's not totally across... Um, the political situations. Um, so I told her, hiya mum, how you love, how are you? All right, good, good, good. I'm off to San Diego for a couple of weeks. All right, and I'm dipping into Mexico for a couple <laughs> of days, but then I'll be back in San Diego. Will I call you when I get back to the States? All right, love, no worries. Um, then I ring her back. You know, I've been with these absolute lunatics for two and a half weeks, checking if my head's still on my neck oh every my morning. God. And then I say, hi mum. She says, how was your holiday? I say... <laughs> It was fine, Mum. It was really fine. Because I'm on a plane, I'm off on my holidays. Um, but that, that's my biggest fear. You know, if anything happened to me, you know, I've had, I mean, I'm only 30 next year, but I've had the most amazing life, the most amazing career. Um, but I'd be gutted for my mum and, and the people that would be left behind. Um, that's my biggest fear. And you were talking earlier on about family of a different kind that is yeah. plays yeah. heavily on your mind. Yeah, so I've got, I've got two kids two boys, one's 11 and one's one. The 11-year-old has kind of grown up with me learning to do my job, and so he's, um, he's taken it on, uh, as I have, really, and he's, he's learned that when Dad says it's fine, it's not always um, 100%. Mm -hmm. With my mum, I'm, I'm afraid I have a very similar mm. um, tactic. She's, she's probably more politically aware, so she does tend to sort right. of go, oh, right, isn't that going on? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh. But <laughs> on the whole, it's about managing information. I find they don't need to know everything. There's yeah. not much they're going to be able to do. And the more they know, actually, the more worries that that, that brings. Um, well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas no, my partner has got used to, to, for instance, I will have not said very much for a few days. And then I'll call her and say, I'm going to be out of out of range for a couple of days, we're going into the jungle, I'll call you when I'm back. And that's sort of it. She knows that that means something is like, well, you know, I'm going into a situation which I can't control in which she's not going to have any information. But I don't want to tell her much more than that. For instance, we're going into the jungle with some guys with guns who are fighting against the local mm -hmm. government because that's just going to worry her. What's key is that she knows she's not going to hear from me. Yeah. Um, so she doesn't need to worry about that. She knows that this is planned, and it's not. She knows who to call planned. if she just and breaks she knows exactly. Yeah. She knows who to call, who to call. Um, <laughs> if, if, yeah. if she doesn't hear from me in a couple of days, but to tell her any more, I find would 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 stress her out and worry her um, yeah. more. From the kids' point of view, I I just find that everything I do, it's a similar story really. I'm privileged to do it. I'm privileged to be in the position to be able to do it, and he's proud to be able to say that I'm his dad, and and that's. That's where I want to keep it, to be honest. Sure. Um, on the second question, right. <laughs> <laughs> on the <laughs> second question about, I mean, this is sort of an internal question, this isn't it, about whether, are you asking whether it's more, it's more difficult? I know it's more difficult. I want to know how they're It's in some ways, in some ways it's more difficult, yeah. and in some ways, my personal view rather, is that in some ways it's more difficult, and in, uh, and in other ways it makes it easier, actually. Um, and particularly if you, uh, you know, if there's two of you and you're, you just act like you're a bit ditzy, then nobody thinks you could possibly be causing any trouble yeah. whatsoever or bringing down a government Absolutely. because they're only women. You know, <laughs> Welcome so to my I, think, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Without a doubt. Yeah, Hello. I think. Yeah, you got to play. On. Uh, so I think there's, I think there's, you know, bonuses as well as um, negatives. But it's huge. What, are, what are the difficulties? Yeah. That dynamic is huge. I mean, I've done a lot of um, documentaries produced and directed um, with gangs. Um, I filmed, you know, kind of uh, big kind of kilo swaps of drugs and arms trade, um, arms kind of um, deals. And what I found was that actually going into a room with, you know, 10 armed men as like, you know, this kind of little British girl carrying my camera like this, it's so much less intimidating from them. And they're forced to react to you in a different way, you know. 
you, they're just not what you expect. And I think, you know, as women, we develop skills through our lives where we are able to put people at ease much more easily. We, because, you know, we've, we come up with conflict so much, you know, just in the street and in our everyday life um, from people that want our time. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that those skills come in to use massively when you're in those situations where you can disarm people like that, yeah. just being a woman. Um, and yeah, it's about what you get out of your contributor when you interview. I've been in situations where I've gotten so much more out of somebody because I'm you know, a woman and they feel a lot more comfortable talking about, you know, mm -hmm. I interviewed a blood in Camden, um, in, in New Jersey, who'd killed you know, 35 people. And it was like a therapy session with him. Um, I got so much more out of him, but there were also situations where you know, I have spoken with people um, in interviews and, you know, they don't want to talk to a woman. They don't respect your position. And mm -hmm. it's then that you have to maybe step back and say, this isn't my battle to fight. I need to get my male producer in to sit down and do the interview for me because mm -hmm. they'll get the better footage. And then there are certainly are situations where you really have to be aware of your own personal safety. Absolutely. is going to be more compromised as a woman as well, you know, and you might need to have um, male fixers or, totally or producers with you. Them. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it's so, so difficult. I think as well, sometimes when you go into these real sort of male-dominated rooms, there's loads of guns, there's loads of gear everywhere. If you're quite tactile, hello, yeah. you know, how you doing? Yeah. What's the story? Kind of fluff their ego, you're not competition. That's so it, immediately yeah. they kind of, and they want to brag and they want to tell you what it's about. Mm. Um, but then there have been other times when I've been in a prison and there's a guy saying he's going to gang rape me. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. You know, he'd love to take my clothes off and do X, Y, and Z. And that's when you have to pretend, I'm not scared of you, I don't care. But inside, you know, you're, you're frightened. Where's the cameraman? Where's the fixer? Just sort of keeping an totally. eye on your, your male um, colleagues. I think having a chat with your male colleagues and discussing your boundaries as a woman yeah. is really important. You know, don't leave me alone in a room yeah. type thing because they won't necessarily recognize it. Mm. Are there any other questions? Oh, right. Sorry, making you work there. Right up at the very back, <laughs> please. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for the climb. <laughs> um, thank you all for a great discussion. Um, it's very similar. Um, question really, but I guess broadening out a bit to sort of um, as well as gender, racial, colour, you know, her all kinds of heritage, um, nationality, everything. Um, in a world of stories where you're probably so passionate about so many different issues and ones that you want to tell, I guess similar question, but where does the kind of um, balance come with, I'm really passionate about this story, I want, you know, it, is it you that should be telling the story? Like you said, you know, okay, this is where my male producer, so how does that kind of psychological balance the conversation you have with yourself? Is this my battle to fight? Am I gonna tell it it's one I wanna believe in? Or so that kind of cultural um, sensitivity, when does that kind of come do into you mean, it? Do you mean like in Chicago, could I just go with a cat, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah, racially, you, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. The black community, you know, they can identify. It's, you know, it's really important, so, yeah. I think, to, to, um, to, first of all, to think of ourselves as, as journalists and filmmakers and, and sort of put ourselves in a box and, and remind ourselves that we're trying to be separate um, and to interact with people in that way. So, yeah, fine, you're black, everyone in this area is black, there's lots of gangsters, I'm black. That doesn't mean that I'm exactly the same as everyone mm. you live with. So I'll use it to open the door, because it's great. He's much more likely to go, oh, hi, and shake my hand, because it's another black guy. But from that, I, I can't then assume that everything's going to be all right. Um, there have been situations in, in the Middle East, for instance, where having a black face has been very useful. There have been times where the hair, for instance, has caused me lots of problems in the Middle East. In Sierra Leone, we were making a film about mental health. We turned up to the one of the few places where they help people with mental health problems, and the guy... Um, who ran the place just had something against people with dreadlocks. He kind of associated it with drug, with drug taking and so on and didn't want me going into his, his institution. Most of the people he was treating had drug related issues. So he didn't want to. One thing we hadn't risk assessed uh, for was your dreadlocks. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Shave yeah. hair. But you always have to kind of, you have to overcome these things, you have to override them. And often it's in the process of overcoming something like that, it's in the comp process of breaking down a sort of a macho guy and making him like you mm. and then respect you as a woman that you suddenly get him to give you the kind of good interview that's going to make it into a film that's going to be quite revealing. Um, so I, I think we all have to use, coming back to earlier questions, well, we all have to use what we've got. Um, there are many times where I'd have thought I was, it was going to be great because I'm in Africa, it's wonderful, but then dreadlocks and mm. Africa, 
mm. it's, it's not it's a it's a harder relationship there may be times where as a woman you think it's going to be very easy and then you realize that for instance prostitutes might feel a bit uncomfortable mm -hmm. talking to mm -hmm. you feel better talking to a man i'm yeah. gonna we are sadly we only have time for one more question so i'm gonna go to this question here and then we're gonna we're gonna have to wind up and uh Hi. Um, how do you balance um, getting access to a really important story and um, realizing when it's just too dangerous to go ahead? Mm. Wow. Mm. We had this... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we had when this in Libya. Uh, sometimes the decisions are made for you. Sometimes, you know, time, time takes care of things. So we, we went to Libya. We made a film in, in Tripoli about the firemen who were sort of trying to deal with all the bombs and explosions and, and, and burning gas canisters. But the film we initially wanted to make was in Benghazi, which was surrounded by ISIS. There was one hospital in the middle of the city which served everybody, ISIS fighters, uh, army soldiers, injured civilians, and we were in with the manager of this hospital. So we desperately wanted to go in to see how it works in the hospital, have her show us around and so on, knowing that there were going to be bombs and things going off. We came and sat with Siobhan, I think twice, we <laughs> went through that story and tried to, tried to get them to agree, and each time we kind of went, oh, well, let's see what happens in the next few days. And eventually um, a load of bombs went off outside the hospital, and it became apparent that we just couldn't, we couldn't go there. Um, I think it's, all, it's also about personal boundaries, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the, that is the key thing. What's too dangerous for one person isn't necessarily dangerous for another. And you know, people have to really be true to their instincts because there's nothing worse. Um, you know, sure, you have to build up your boundaries, and they, do get, they get, do get bigger as time goes on. But I think there's nothing worse than going somewhere, w sort of being forced or yeah. forcing yourself to go somewhere that is beyond your mm -hmm. boundaries. Because it's just, you know, A, you'll not do great work. B, you'll make si si um, scary decisions. Mm. And it's just not nice being terrified out of your wits for several weeks yeah, as a, true. you know. And rec I think in that vein, recognizing that the boundaries of your crew are going to be very different mm. if they're people of color, if they have a disability, if they're a woman or a non-binary person, you have to account for them as well. Because if you're on the shoot with them and you know you feel comfortable, then do they? Mm. Or, you yeah. know, it affects everyone in different ways. You know, there have been times where I felt really comfortable. Um, and my cameraman's gone around the corner and burst into floods of tears. And there have been other times where I felt like, I think it's really going to kick off. And my director's like, nah, spot on. No, you've, you've read that wrong. So it's kind of like you say, that gut feeling, you should always trust it, I think. Sure. Trust your gut. That's yeah. what it comes down to. You just, and try not to kick yourself too much afterwards that you didn't yeah. get a shot. That's yeah. the yeah. thing. Go Might easy. have just got the gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Go easy on yourself. Okay, yeah. sadly, that's all we've got time for. Um, please do give a big round of applause for our brilliant panel, Shay, <laughs> Becky, and Stacey. Thank you.